We never figured out what happened to Bob, right? Hey, everybody. Uh, sorry we're a little bit late corner. starting tonight. <laughs> All right, sorry we're a little bit late starting tonight. We have uh, a few technical issues, and uh, we managed to get... Uh, one of the NMRX team to get up really early in the morning to uh, to an assist. So uh, we're live now with uh, the national leadership of the NMRA. Uh, we'll still go for the same amount of time. Um, just like when you join the NMRA and you pay for the magazine, you get 12 issues, no matter when you first get your first one. So this is exactly the same. You'll get your hour and a half, no, no worries. So uh, the format for this evening is we will go and uh, ask the questions that you guys have put in uh, in advance to our panel and uh, we will then go and take questions from the stream so if you have a question as we go pop it in the stream and uh, we'll pull that to one side and, uh, and ask and ask the questions at the end um, but before we go into answering the questions I think it's really important that we introduce a few faces that people may not have seen on the internet before uh, and certainly to our non-members uh, my, my, my voice has a weird echo. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's because I'm in a big empty train room, uh, which you can't see behind me. So uh, hopefully it's not too annoying. Uh, hopefully it won't be me speaking too much either. Um, so what we'll do is we will go around uh, around the room and let the guys introduce themselves and uh, who they are, where they are, and what their role is in the organization. So we'll start with NMRA president, uh, Mr. Pete McGoon, MMR. Pete. Wow, fancy tones and everything. <laughs> I'm Pete McGarren. I'm uh, in northern Michigan right now where it's very hot, humid, and a glorious summer day. I model the railroads north and east of Boston circa 1954, and I'm also into the main two-footers. So yes, I am narrow-minded. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. And we'll go to uh, Vice President of Special Projects, uh, Mr. Jerry Leon, MMR next. That, that's true, Gordy. It's uh, Jerry Leon, MMR. Um, I'm sitting right now about 45 minutes northwest of Minneapolis in our brand new house. We've been here for two weeks. Um, I have no train layout right now, but I have a lot of parts for one. And as I keep calling it, it's a scratch building kit for my new layout. So um, we'll be working on that pretty soon. <laughs> and we'll go to Jack. Hi there, I'm Jack Hamilton, live in the Pacific Northwest to the west of Seattle. That doesn't mean the Pacific Ocean, by the way. I'm an end scaler. Um, I've been uh, with the NMRA leadership uh, for a few years, uh, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm the guy that writes the tool car column and have a ball doing it. Jack is also the at-large worldwide director. Really? <laughs> Beat me to it. And uh, we'll go to Frank. All right. I'm Frank. Frank Koch. I live just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. I model O scale, two rail O scale, uh, the coal fields of eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. And my role in the NMRA, I actually have three at the national level. One is I am the chief financial officer. Secondly, I am the manager of administration. So all the people at headquarters report to me. And thirdly, I am the committee chairman for the AP department. And we'll go to uh, Mr. Jim Gore, MMR. Hi, I'm Jim. I'm uh, living right now, at least for the last six months, in Conway, New Hampshire. Before that, I was in uh, Florida for about 20 years. I model ON30, um, northern New Mexico, in about 1951. I also am the at-large North American director, and I manage the modeling with the master's program. Cool. And we will go to uh, John Bate next. Hi, I'm, oh, better wait for a second or two. Uh, I'm John Bate. I live in Winnipeg, Canada. I'm the Canadian district director of the NMRA. I'm the, the new kid on the block, uh, just joined last month. Uh, I model an N-scale uh, layout in southern British Columbia. 
and I'm looking forward to another three years on the board. And uh, Diedrich Voss? Hi, Diedrich Voss. Uh, I'm the Western District Director. The district is everything west of the Mississippi, uh, including Alaska. I modeled the Everett Monte Cristo Railroad circa 1900. I uh, live just north of Seattle, Washington. And he is also an MMR. Oh, and MMR, sorry. And uh, we will go to uh, Mr. Bob Amsler, who is no camera, but is here with us. Hi, Bob Amsler. I'm from South St. Louis City, and I'm out of the Mopac. And I'm general counsel as well as the manager for the uh, meetings and train shows department. Thanks, boss. Okay, uh, thanks, guys. So uh, we'll go into the questions. So as I said, we're going to go um, into the into these by topic. Um, I think the first topic that's probably most pertinent to this group is the topic that I have dubbed uh, national strategy, policy, and management of the National Model Railroad Association. So uh, we'll go into the first question. It coming. It's coming from Marcus in the Sunshine region. And Marcus asks, the NMRA is lacking members in the age range 15 to 55. So if you over to Europe, they seem to do much better in that age range. Are there any plans from the NMRA to actively take this on, like more exposure to the public and distribution of information about new possibilities regarding materials and techniques? Who wants to take that question? Gordy, I'll take that one on Jack? first. Um, it's Jack Hamilton. Uh, Anne Murray has been looking at membership, obviously, for the past number of years um, and, and has done a fair amount of research. About five years ago, uh, using uh, with members from virtually every region, we completed a very detailed study of membership organizations, best practices, where to go and how to get there. And the two things we came up with is before we worry about recruiting, we better fix retention. And when we talk about recruiting, we really need to look at a, uh, at a group of people who are best fit to our mission. And our mission, by the way, is to support existing model railroaders with some development, but it's not to expand and broaden the hobby. Uh, one of the things we found is that uh, the the normalized model railroader who, who enters the hobby and stays there has uh, several qualities. One, he has some free time, which generally means at retirement or near retirement. It means he's got space, which means he's an empty nester. And it also means he has some discretionary dollars to spend. You plug all of those together and you start talking about people who are nominally 45 years or older and it turns out that happens to be the best place for us uh, to sell our NMRA association membership. Now with respect to the our exposure to the hobby uh, at all train shows at all events and at all activities obviously we are dealing with the public we are we are showing the um, hobby uh, as best we can, and we're encouraging people to be involved. But the membership, the membership effort, has to be at a target group that that will, in fact, not only be able to come on board but stay on board. The one change that you you can expect to see over the next year or so is that having just passed a update to the long range plan, the board will establish quotas. Uh, each year to gain a net membership gain of 300 members per year. Uh, the quotas will be handed out or passed out to regions and the regions and divisions will be charged with the responsibility of bringing those new members on board. <clears throat> That's it. Answer. Jack, can I chime in there? So we'll go to Pete McGoon first, then we'll go back to Jerry. Okay, Jack hit three of the five major categories for participation in this hobby. Have time, have space, have money, tools and interest. 
Okay, the people who have all of those are indeed the about to be retired or the newly retired, but they also have a bonus in there that we don't talk about much, and that's they have grandkids. And with some of the things that we've done over the last year or so, we can begin to get those grandkids into the hobby and help out with the protections that those grandkids deserve from various family members and so on, protections provided by family members. The um, other thing there is retention. And this is a burr under my saddle because we are doing pretty well overall getting people to come in the door. We lose out because they don't stay. Why? We need to make this organization welcoming. That has to happen at the division level because the division is where the individual member meets the NMRA. So when the new person shows up, you let the new person sit over in the corner over there all alone. Nobody bothers to go over and say, hi, welcome aboard. Come on in, join the party. You're one of us. And the new member realizes, wait a minute, there are all these people having fun and this is all a bunch of clicks. Forget it. I don't need this aggravation. And they disappear never to be seen again. By the way, they'll also go out and tell about 2,000 of their best friends on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever the other social media platform du jour is. So you bring those people in, welcome them aboard, recognize that they are part of your tribe. They are your peeps, as it were. Make them feel welcome, and you may just find out that that high school kid has the answers to all of the technical problems that have been bedeviling your club for the last three years. But you'll never know that until you actually engage that individual in a welcoming discussion. So let's stop bellowing about how we're not doing anything, and let's, at the division level, please, I've said this before, I'll say it again, at the division level, please engage the new people, make them feel like they are your friends because they are your friends. You just don't know it yet. Jerry. Yeah, um, one of the things that we have to consider is the fact that the NMRA has pretty limited resources as far as going out and attracting members. Um, and when you stop and look at the hobby as a whole, you, you realize that the Kalmbach folks, the model railroad folks, are doing just an excellent job with beginners' articles, with beginners' books. You know how to model, uh, you know three project layouts and that sort of stuff. And for us to start trying to attract those same people would be kind of doubling the effort toward them. And we again, we just don't have the resources to be able to spread. Um, from 15 year olds to, to 55 year olds. And, and as Jack said uh, very well, we've got to concentrate on, on you know, as we, the, the phrase that we're always using is we have to fish where the fish are and where the fish are, are the, the near retirement folks with the disposable income and the, and the time to do it. That's, that's where our resources are best spent. Okay, Gordy. One last sum up. One last sum up on that is okay. that, um, and and Pete did it very well. Uh, if if you have people in the division out working their butts off to recruit new people, but then you ignore them when they walk in the door, you're not going to keep them. And and it is at the division level, with the support from the region and NMRA, that we are going to resolve and grow our membership. It, without that help, it's not going to happen at all. Okay, okay, thanks, guys. Um, just a few points I want you to just clarify there because I think a few things that may have been misinterpreted uh, from what Wait, you said. Go, I don't Gordy. think that's what you. Yeah. Go, Pete. Yeah, if I may, one amplification on what Jack started with. The IRS ex has classified the NMRA as a not for profit member service educational corporation those are the rules that we have to operate under not-for-profit member service educational corporation okay that does not mean go out there and do missionary work which is the job of the manufacturers the hobby press and so on that means 
member service education let's do it yeah okay so a couple of, a couple of things i'd like you guys just to clarify um because uh what a lot of people heard there is that the nma is not actually interested in people that are uh under 45 or not retired and and being uh being 33 and running one of the NMRA's programs i don't believe that that's the case just want you guys okay to let me that. let me yeah let me talk to that one gordy no i it, there is no there is no intent to say we are not interested in Right. People under 45, people who are not retired, um, or or people who are living with families, from a membership standpoint, uh, where we are, if we only have limited assets, and we only have an ability to do uh, certain things, and that's very clear by the number of people we have available at the division level working on this, we need to concentrate where we will get maximum benefit for the association now, and that happens to be in the primary target group. Okay, and uh, another piece of clarification, and this is just, a, if we can make this a really short yes or no answer, um, I don't believe that we're saying that uh, people that don't have time and space are not model railroaders because I know of a significant number of model railroaders who are having to downsize in their later years. Uh, people that are in the military who are still model railroaders. Um, I actually have a friend who uh, used to scratch build locomotives in his foxhole in Afghanistan. So I know it can happen. So I just want you guys to confirm that that's not what we were saying either. We are not. Not. No, that is true. <clears throat> It's a matter of focus. Okay, um, cool. Let's move on to another question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, same topic, membership. Um, there's two questions here. So it's a part one and a part two question. Uh, this is from Andy in the British region. And Andy asks, um, anecdotal re market research seems to indicate that the commercial market in the hobby has seen uh, a growth of around 5% year on year recently whilst the NMRA has seen a decline in membership. And what the, the, Andy asks, what do you think uh, is the reason for this apparent disconnect between membership numbers and the growth of the hobby? Who'd want to take that? Hmm. I'll take it. The answer, the answer to that one actually is exactly what we said the first time around. If you, we have no problem recruiting new members, our problem is retaining hmm. people. And, and the, the, the issue there is that current members are not paying attention to new members in a manner which is makes them feel that they are part of the association. So that's, retention is the first thing we have to correct to make that work. And then we'll begin to see the growth. Uh, Frank? Yeah, I have a little bit, I agree with Jack, but I have a little bit different spin on it. And that is that over the last 10 years, there's been a great proliferation in terms of what I'll call niche hobby interest groups. The N-scale modelers, the narrow gauge modelers, uh, various historical society modelers, the modular groups, all of those have uh, come about and that is what is attracting a lot of people. They'll get into the hobby, they may come to the NMRA, but then they find out, for example, that there's an N scale group somewhere and they go and join that and they find that all their needs are being met there. The second thing that's happening is that there is so much free material available on the internet now that there's no need for somebody to belong to an organization. They can simply go to the internet and determine anything they want. Of course, the big thing they miss there is the socialization but uh, for some, that's not important. So there's a whole variety of factors entering into the question or the answer. Okay, cool. Uh, we'll go to the next question. Um, so Andy, this is from Andy again. Um, and Andy asks, has there been any change in the membership numbers during the, during the past six months due to either um, COVID or uh, an increase in, in online activities from regions, divisions, and the national NMRA? Who wants to take that one? Uh, Frank, again? Yeah, I've been looking at this since uh, last November, and the answer is I don't think so, but it's actually 
too early to, to tell. The international regions do membership only twice. All their people expire, uh, memberships expire at about two points in the year. And in the U.S., it's every month, of course. And there doesn't seem to be any drastic drop off in, in renewals. Uh, but we'll have to watch it over time. I expect as we get into the fall season, if COVID doesn't flare up again, that uh, things might be okay. The fact that everybody is offering, or virtually every division and region are offering virtual uh, events says that interest is still high. Uh, people have reported that they're actually getting more people attending their virtual events than before. So perhaps there is a silver lining in all of this and that uh, re retention may be helped. I think we'll just have to wait and see, but so far, nothing obvious. Anybody, else, anybody want to add that? Uh, Frank said it right. Uh, we'll go back. Yep, we'll go back to the top. Okay, we're moving away from membership questions for now, although there have been a few in the chat that I was just uh, typing in there. Um, as we go, guys, um, if you're in the chat and you've got a question you want to ask, uh, pop it in and I will uh, I will ask it at the end. Um, okay, uh, Nicholas uh, from the Mid-Eastern region uh, has a HQ question. Um, and he asks, do you believe that the NMRA presenting itself to the world, um, the media, potential members, etc., via a post office box in a place named Soddy Daisy, uh, sends the right message to these audiences? Uh, who wants to answer the question about Soddy Daisy? Uh, we'll go to Jim Gore and then we'll go to Frank. I, I tried to yeah. ponder that question for a long time. We tried to get the state of Tennessee to change the name, but they just wouldn't do it. I'm not sure what, what the question is. That's where it happens to be headquartered. It's a fine name, but <laughs> I'm not sure what the question is. Saudi Daisy is a name. Uh, Frank? Well, two, it's really two parts. One, the fact that we have, well, we actually have two addresses. One is a PO box. Um, and the second is that uh, the city in which we're located. The first question, the P.O. box, we also have a street address. But hey, guys, nobody's there on the weekends and nobody's there after hours. So we get the mail we get, we get about 50,000 pieces of mail a year. And the only way to really manage that is through a P.O. box. You can't really do it through a street address. The, uh, the mailbox just is subject to damage. And of course, all deliveries of uh, packages and such come to our street, ad street address on Gulfview uh, Avenue. The second question, Saudi Daisy. Saudi Daisy is a big uh, old time railroad town, big in the uh, coal business. So, and it's not any different than uh, White River being located in Buckland, Missouri, or, or wherever it is. And, or any other big company that's located in some uh, city name that people just don't recognize. It's, it doesn't have an effect. Um, and it's a positive kind of thing. I mean, we used to be in, for a while, we were in Canton, Ohio, and our headquarters at one time were in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, it hasn't mattered over the years, and I don't think it matters now. No, I, I can think of some places in Orkney where you could have a very interesting name for your, uh, <laughs> or Scotland, where you could, it could be a P.O. box in Dull, Perthshire. Um, or boring Oregon, so uh, I don't think Sunny Days is all that bad. Um, um, thanks for your question, Nicholas. Okay, we'll move on. Another HQ question here. Um, this is from Bruce, who's a life member of the NFR um, in Canada. So, John, this is a Canada uh, member for you. Uh, in these days of being able to join the NMRA online, how can uh, how can the national team justify it taking eight weeks or more to, for people to receive membership information from headquarters? Why is this happening? Uh, what what are we doing to fix this, and and how long will it take before this improves? Who wants to take that question. I think that's a Frank. Uh, Frank. That sounds like a Frank. Question. I think it's a Frank question. <laughs> um, actually, actually, there there the, the question says. Uh, join online and renew online and a lot of it depends on where what region you're in because i think all the regions offer online registration and in some cases if you're in one of the international regions either 
uh, UK, Europe, Canada, or Australia, New Zealand, uh, if the local office, local business office doesn't forward the information to Saudi Daisy, uh, there will be a, a lag in the time. But most of them are pretty good about it. In the U.S., online memberships are processed every single day. And we send out membership cards and information at least every 10 days. And the big delay is if the question is, why don't I get a magazine for two months? The answer is that's the lead time between when we print the address labels and the issue date that comes for the next magazine. Uh, for example, if you look, easy thing to do is look at, in your magazine, if you get the magazine, look at the AP reports. They're about three months behind. And I'll just tell you that uh, I just did a report yesterday. It, went to, it will go to Cynthia tonight. It will be at the printers this week but you will not see it in the magazine until the October issue. That's the lead time in terms of magazines. So as uh, Gordy said early on, everyone still gets 12 magazines uh, depending on when they start. So, I mean, we're looking at this all the time now. If there's a specific case, we'll be glad to investigate it, but we need specifics, not just generalities. Mm -hmm. so, Frank, if somebody, we'll Johnny, a second. So Frank, if somebody uh, if somebody does have a question about their membership, where's the best place for them to, to send that question? Well, two you know, all you can do it. The place to go is if you're a U.S. person, you go to uh, send an email to nmrahq at nmra.org, or you send it to me, and I'll take care of it. I guarantee it. If you're in an international person, then you send it to your your region's business office. Thanks, Frank. Uh, John? Yeah, just the, as it happens, this topic came up a few nights ago in the NMRA Canada annual general meeting. And one of the things that uh, we found out was that there are many links in the chain often where it will go to a region and the region will put it to NMRA Canada and then NMRA Canada will put it up to Saudi Daisy and then it has to come back down the chain sometimes uh, with membership lists before the division gets a list in their hand. There are many links in the chain and you have to remember that all of these links with the possible exception of one in Saudi Daisy are volunteers who have other things and, and jobs and so on and there's frequently a delay and you know one fellow who was at the meeting you know sort of owned up, yeah, I guess they kind of sat on my desk for about a week and a half. So, you know, these things uh, will happen. Uh, and it's not all instantly through the computer automatic. It does go through people's hands and there's, you know, people are off in a delay. Uh, and if you're in Canada and you have problems with that, uh, the person in Canada to contact is uh, Stephen Wood, our business manager. Uh, and uh, I don't have his email address committed to memory right at the moment, but uh, you could always email me and I'll forward it. My uh, email address is in the uh, NMRA magazine and the NMRA website. You can get at me there. Thanks. Uh, Frank, then we'll go to Peter and then we'll go to another question. Frank? Just, real, just a real short one. An example of this is that uh, a couple of years ago, we had an instance in one of our regions. They had a big show, and they recruited about 10 people. And at the end of the show, the person who collected the money and the, red, and the uh, membership forms put them in his footlocker, packed up all his stuff, put it in his garage, and didn't pull it out again for six months. Now, that's an extreme case. But uh, as, as John said, it happens. It'll sit on somebody's desk. At HQ, nothing sits there. They uh, can't stand money not being in the bank. Uh, Mr. McGee. Okay, I will agree with what Frank said, but I will also add that the mail that is sent out of HQ is sent out in a bulk process form, which means that they may hang on to it for a week so that they can send it all out together because it's a lot less expensive for us to mail it that way than it is to start slapping stamps on everything and put them out, you know, five times a week. So we're actually saving member money by doing bulk mail of things like renewals. It's about a third the cost. Okay, cool.
All right, thanks, guys. We'll move on. Um, so Dave uh, from the SER has a question about youth policy, and there are, there are two questions about youth policy, so we may end up uh, asking these these twice. Um, question: The first question from Dave um, is, uh, with the directive uh, involved with scouting or other youth groups for liability concerns, how does the NMRA propose we attract younger modelers into the organisation? We'd like to take that. Uh, Pete, and then Jim, go to Pete first. And my computer just went dead. You're there. We'll go to Jim, that's okay. Okay, Gordy, we've had this discussion in several different forums over a lot of years now. And the answer is very simple. A, we are a member service organization. B, the people who have the money that's necessary to, to really get involved with the hobby are not young people in school. They may be, as you mentioned, guys on ships doing their you know, third deployment or whatever, been there, done that, and I end scaled while I was doing that sort of thing. Uh, but they are the newly retired and so on. That's where the fish are, as Jerry put it, that's where we fish. So uh, directive not to become involved with scouting or other youth groups or liability concerns. Um, Bob Amsler can feel free to correct me here, but we have not said you cannot become involved with scouting. What we have said is that you have to go through a different path to offer your services to whatever that youth organization may be. So no longer does the scout council call you up and say, hey, we're having a merit bench check on the uh, 15th of next month. Can you guys come uh, you know, do a, a railroading merit batch. And you say, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And it gets advertised as being the whatever council with the Duckweed Falls Division of the NMRA as sponsors. No more. What you can do is say, that sounds interesting. I will float it to my people and see if we can get some volunteers for you. At which point you go to your division meeting and say, hey, the local scout council wants to do this. And if you guys are interested, please call so-and-so at this number and offer your assistance. But what that does is make an individual offering knowledge, sharing the know-how, as they say in the British region, without dragging in the NMRA as a named uh, institution. So all we've done really... Now he's gone. <laughs> Now we've gone. Uh, Jim? Well, all I wanted to add, what, what Pete said is absolutely correct. It's not that you're banned from involving yourself in youth activities. It's just that you can't say that it's an NMRA-sponsored uh, activity. I, <clears throat> I can give you an example of the same sort of thing. For 40 years, I was a professor of biology at a number of different universities. But the last 10 years or so, I was at the University of Tampa. And I can go to the local Boy Scout Council and I can say, I'd like to teach nature, the nature merit badge, or I'd like to teach a course in reptile and amphibian study or something like that. And here are my qualifications and I'd be glad to put it together for you. But I can't say, oh, by the way, this is sponsored by the University of Tampa. It's not. It's me as an individual who has the expertise. In the same way, if you're an individual with the expertise in model railroading, you can go to any Boy Scout Council and say, hey, I'd be glad to put together a program for the railroading merit badge, for example. So it's not a matter of, of uh, it's just a matter of not indicating that it's being sponsored by or affiliated with the NMRA. That's all. And, and I think it's actually a little bit more to a sense that uh, the NMRA division or region cannot do anything to further that along. They can only make the announcement and that's and it's up to the individual to go from that point on. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, next question, um, this is Chuck from the NER. 
Um, this may be a question that's good for you, Bob, to answer because it's about uh, paperwork related to the youth and at-risk persons policy. Um, can you explain the at-risk persons policy when notarized affidavits are required? It is unclear if affidavits are required for parents, legal guardians, or both. What impact do you think requiring affidavits will have on at-risk persons having any involvement with the NMRA in the future? Why could at-risk persons just require? Why couldn't at-risk persons just require a parent or legal guardian be present at all times without the onerous task of obtaining a notarized affidavit? Okay. Uh, the first part of the question is: Parents uh, don't need a notarized affidavit; they're the parent. Now, what could happen is if uh, the young child, you know, 15, 16 year old kid or whatever. Uh, has a cousin who's 22 that goes to the meetings. He's also interested in model railroading. He wants to come. Well, then the cousin needs to get an affidavit. Or if it's the neighbor across the street who's got the railroad in his basement the kid likes and wants to join the NMRA, then you need an affidavit. But if you think about it this way, if the kid is going to a ball game with the neighbor and there's a car accident or something, the neighbor can't make any health care decisions for that kid. The neighbor is just there. So there's no one technically responsible for the kid. By requiring the affidavit, we, we know of just a few things. One, the parent has said, this guy can act on my behalf. And second, if you notice, inside the affidavit, it actually tells him the duties that that person has to be physically present in the same room as the kid watching what's going on. So that's why we require an affidavit. There's a clear delegation of responsibility and the statement that that person understands he needs to be present and watching what goes on. Thanks, thanks, Bob. That's a great explanation. Sure. We'll move on. Um, Bruce in the PCR, um, I guess that's the West Coast. Um, so someone for the West Coast may want to answer this, uh, but I think this is a general one. Management, this is the topic, and it's uh, does the NMRA leadership, the board of directors, and at national and regional level undergo any volunteer association management training? I guess we'll go to, to Jack for this one. Um, currently, the answer is nothing formal. Uh, we have a, uh, for the board of directors, we have a uh, orientation manual. Um, and there's a lot of inter talk, interplay back and forth. However, in the recently adopted uh, NMRA uh, 2015 plan update, there is a formal requirement to create and conduct training at the national leadership level, and similarly to provide a training process for the region and division level uh, personnel so that we can, uh, we can better uh, prepare ourselves to do these jobs. Uh, Gordy, Jack, before I jump off, uh, before I dump off that one, let me offer to you that the presumption that the only qualifications for an elected position with the NMRA is that I've been a modeler for 25 years is is really wrong. When you look at the qual the background business qualifications of the national leadership, the people who are currently on the board filling the department head positions, you can find every one of these people has had a life of major management uh, and leadership positions. We just need to do a little bit more tailoring to put it in place for a membership association. Okay, and so my question to you is, um, you've mentioned uh, a few times uh, this evening or this afternoon in the States um, about the long-term plan that's just been a, a agreed and approved. Has that been placed somewhere where members can go and review it and read it? Or is that going to happen? It should be on the website when the minutes for the, uh, the summer meeting are approved. Okay, so not, not right now, but maybe in the future. Yeah, as soon as the minutes are approved, it's part of that. Uh, it's a part of the minutes of that meeting, so it should be posted when be. the minutes are posted. It will be posted. Okay, uh, okay uh, next question is around insurance, and this is from Tage in the NER. Um, 
Will the NMRA's liability insurance policy cover any COVID-19 related claims? And, and the answer is, technically no. we don't know. So the answer is no, it does not. Okay. I've seen some interesting things. I say, I say, I've seen some interesting legal arguments, but uh, whether any of that's going to work or not, I don't want to be the first one to find out. Uh, no, <laughs> not recommended. Thanks, thanks, Bob. Uh, everyone, that was uh, Bob Amsler, the, the general counsel, the NMRA, answering that question. Um, okay, and the next question. Oh, sorry, Frank. Do you want to add to that? No, just a, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this, and and the, the big issue is. In these days of the pandemic, why would any organization want to expose either their members or the public to the possible risk of infection? And whether there's insurance or not is a separate question, but uh, I mean, we have to show good moral turpitude here, or good moral responsibility here in terms of not having meetings where people are going to get sick or where there's a high risk. Uh, so we urge everyone just to be careful. And make wise decisions. Thanks, Frank. Um, okay, last question on the uh, NMA uh, national strategy, policy, and leadership and management. Uh, is a question on management from Scott in the uh, NCR, and and Scott asks, uh, what else can the national do to provide clear and timely communication to the needs and interests of the regions? Simply put. How do we get a good and quick answer from the national when we need it? So far, everything seems to be top-down communication, not bottom-up from the members. Who wants to take that question about communication? Pete, we'll go to Pete. And... <laughs> Pete's Pete, talking with you there. Pete, we've got no audio. We'll let you fix your audio. We're going to go to Jim. There's okay. still no audio. Well, I was going to say that we'll go to, we'll go to Jim. In my experience, that's not true. Um, I get uh, maybe a half a dozen or more questions from various regions all over, anywhere. <laughs> and I, I do my best to answer the question as I can or find somebody within the organization who can answer that question. So it's a matter of asking. I don't think it's necessarily uh, all top down. You got to get somebody to give to ask the question. All of our email addresses are right there in the magazine masthead every year. Or I mean, every every month. So uh, just just get a hold of any of those directors and ask. Okay, we'll go to Jerry. And 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 besides the magazine, just to add to what Jim just said, they're on the website. Um, so it's easy enough to email anyone or all of the directors or officers with a question. And I, I can guarantee you that people kind of jump to when they get a question, as Jim said, to if either answer it or find somebody who can answer it. I, I don't think there's any, I think the lag in communication is the person asking the question and the lag is between that question and when he's actually asking somebody it. Okay. Uh, Pete, we're going to see if your audio is back. Then we're going to we're going to move on, Jack, just to keep going. Pete, okay. anyone hearing Pete? No, 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 no. Get yourself a pen and a piece of paper. <laughs> see, that's that's the way it goes. All right. Uh, so what happens when you're live, guys? We'll get Pete. We'll get Pete back. <laughs> yes. Hey, Gordy. Uh, one last thing on that. Um, I, I receive all sorts of communications from people, be it AP, general questions, or magazine stuff. So I'm not sure exactly why I'm not reachable, because apparently I am. Yeah, I feel very reachable as well, but it's it's okay. Frank, go ahead and then we'll, well, we'll just move another on. short one. There is a if people send a general question in that goes to the HQ address. The, the people at HQ are very, very diligent about sending the message forward to the right person, usually two people, and then making sure that they answer the question. So I'm, I'm like several others have said, I get probably 50, 50 to 60 messages a week from members on all sorts of different topics. 
And I answer every one of them very quickly. Uh, the, the downside I see to that is I've only answered the question, if you will, for one person. And there's 15,000 15, other members who don't get that answer. So we use the e-bulletin where we can. We use the magazine where we can. And if it's a big enough question, we'll put it up on the website in the appropriate place as a Q&A. Um, but yeah, we can all, I think we've all committed, the board has committed that we will respond to members quickly. Thanks guys. Okay, so people, people that are here uh, watching the stream, if you've got any suggestions on uh, membership uh, communication methods we are not doing, um, uh, that you think might work, then pop them in the comments and, and I'll make sure those get shared with uh, with the national leadership after the event. That will give you all something to do while you are uh, watching us uh, try to get Pete's audio back. Um, okay, we're going to move away from uh, national management and we're going to move on to some more operational questions. Uh, so we'll change the topic and the new topic that we're looking at is NMRA publications. Uh, so we have three questions already in on this topic, but there's been there's been quite a few questions been posted in the chat around similar to this. So uh, if you've posted a question about publications in the chat, particularly digital magazines, then uh, stand by. I'm going to ask a few questions on that. And, and hopefully if your question's not been answered, then post it again in the comments on the live stream. So question one is from Joe uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and regarding digital magazines, he asks, um, he, he made a proposal, which I, I shared the link with uh, with you guys before this tonight. Uh, and he asks, uh, have you seen his proposal for doing a test the waters digital PDF version of the NMRA magazine? He says it would be very low cost and it takes the organization from being on the sidelines uh, to gathering actually empirical data on how much real interest there is in a digital version. And he has posted his uh, link um, to his proposal also in the Facebook event for, for tonight. So who wants to take that question? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it generically. This has been, this question has been running for probably seven years. It has been studied. It has been under review. It has been analyzed. It has been boxed, wrapped, ripened and bowed and sent off many, many times. The, right now, Anamarie Magazine cannot economically move into digital format. However, comma, the ongoing process of review and determination continues. And as soon as we can do it economically, we will then address it and, and determine whether that's the way we want to go. And Gordy, by the way, this applies to all three of these questions. They are the same question. Where's my digital magazine? Uh, yeah, but we'll, we'll get some answers from Pete. Are you there? No. I can see your voice. I can see your lips, but I can't, I can't hear you. We'll go to, we'll go to Jerry Leone. Um, you know, one of the things that's real interesting was not that many years ago, maybe two years ago, we did a a survey of a, of a random group of members asking them if they would uh, subscribe to a digital version of the magazine. And what surprised a lot of people was the fact that the overwhelming majority of people said, no, I don't want a digital magazine. I want a printed magazine. The, the, part, of the, part of the problem that the I am called problem, but part of the thing that we run up against is the fact that the majority of our current members want to print. Um, so we've got to cater to those um, uh, uh, current members because they're paying dues and they're, and they're paying the subscription fee. Um, it would be great to do a digital version of the magazine also. Um, and, uh, you know, but again, we have, to, we have to look at what our current members actually want. That's what they told us. Thanks, Jerry. Bob, could you just mute for me? We're just getting a lot of uh, feedback from your audio. It's okay. Thank you. Um, Pete, are you there? No. No. No, still no Pete. Still no Pete. Um, it's amazing. Don't know what we've done. I 
Oh dear. Okay. Well, um, uh, we'll move. We'll, we'll move to Frank. Okay. As as Jerry said, this is something we've and Jack has said this is something we've looked at and continue to look at. The publications department looks at this continuously. We've had confidential discussions with the major magazine uh, manufacturers, producers, Kalmbach and Karstens, and now White River. And it turns out that uh, in the in that part of the world, the interest by the public in terms of getting digital switching or getting both is not very high. Uh, it's less than 10 percent that people want the digital version. And as Jerry said, we did the survey and an overwhelming somewhere around 75 percent of our members didn't want a digital version. They want the print version. The somebody talked about uh, fiscally responsible or fiscally possible. I mean, we could do it, but it would mean that 100% of our members would have to subscribe to the magazine uh, to get the magazine as part of their membership cost. Right now it's an option. And to cover the cost, we'd have to uh, impose that, if you will, on every single member. And about 30% of our members have already told us they don't want it. So we might lose them. So it's a balance of um, whether we do it or don't do it. And right now it's still in the, the uh, vein that says we're not going to do it. However, we've had discussions with White River and we think, I think, I don't know what Kevin would say, but uh, I think we're within a couple of years of probably having a viable option to do it. Now, on the other hand, if we weren't in the print business and we're starting from scratch, I think we would be digital, but we're not. And uh, we can't go back to where we were, so we'll uh, move forward. Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, so there's a question there uh, from from Kenneth in the LSR. He's asked, um, would it reduce the cost of, of membership if we had a digital magazine? Um, so is that is that not the case? No. Frank? Well, for you, it would reduce your cost because you would not have to pay the postage. But for... U.S. people, it would probably be about the same because we pay virtually nothing for postage for the magazine. And so uh, we wouldn't have to pay to print it anymore. But uh, the membership cost would not go down, but the subscription cost uh, would go down. Might. Probably in the range of 25 or 30 or 20 to 25 dollars if if we made every single member take the magazine. And as we've, we've looked at it, there's a major risk of that because a lot of members don't are not willing to incur that extra cost. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Um, OK, let's move on away from digital uh, and NMRA publications. I guess the question that wasn't answered there was for with Joe particularly was uh, he asked if anyone actually uh, read his uh, proposal. And I suppose we should answer his, his specific question there, Frank. Well, until you sent it out, I was totally unaware that it was there because it went to MRH. It did not come out to a place where this, the NRA board would have ever seen it. Uh, yes, I did read it. I've downloaded it and read it and uh, found it interesting. And I'll share it with the publications department. Hey, thanks, Frank. Um, uh, Jim, go on. Uh, just in passing, there's something that, that Pete and I have talked about a lot, and that is um, there's a certain percentage, I don't know exactly what it is, but it could be as much as about 15, 20% of the membership don't have access to a computer or want access mm -hmm. to a computer. So you have to serve them as well. And that becomes problematic when we have to do both digital and print copy. Yep, okay, let's go. We're gonna move on to uh, achievement program questions. Um, so Mike in the PCR asks, uh, he's curious about the Golden Spike Award. Uh, some say it requires two witnesses, others say one. What's the official line on how many witnesses you need for a golden spike? Frank? 
Well, the answer is only one. If you look at the form, there's only one place for one witness. Now, if it's an SOQ for the other certificate, then two witnesses are required. But for uh, if he has some specific example where he could, where it shows that he requires two, then uh, I wish he'd share that with me so I could undo it because it's only one. And and I would I would there add on mind. to that I would add on to that one more thing. That's any NMRA member in good standing Correct. can witness That's Golden right. Spike. Correct. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, okay, Roger in the Mid Eastern region uh, asks when will the achievement program requirements be updated to reflect this century? Uh, electrical, motive, power, and rolling stock, in his opinion, need the most updates. Who'd like to take that first? Frank, I saw the hand just dis just appearing gently. There you go. Well, since I'm the AP manager, I think that probably comes to me. Uh, first, I'd say that every the all the requirements are under constant review. Anytime a member sends in a suggestion in terms of what we might look at, there's a panel of master model railroaders as well as my region AP managers that take those under advisement and consider the pros and cons. And when a change is appropriate, uh, I take that then to the board and recommend we make a change. Uh, the biggest change in terms, uh, well, I don't, electrical, we cover DC, DCC, dead rail, and anything else with electrical now. Uh, people should remember that there are, in all the elements, the sub-elements of the requirements in electrical, there's a category called other, and all you have to do is if you have something that doesn't seem to be listed specifically, just do it in other, uh, and that will work. Or talk it with your division or region or national AP manager, and they'll tell you how to make it happen. Uh, motive power and rolling stock. The biggest suggestion people want to make is that we stop requiring any demonstration of craftsmanship uh, or quality in the models. Uh, there is a subgroup that says um, acquisition of models should be sufficient because I can buy anything I need. So if I want a DP 40-2-46-3B, whatever, uh, I can go out and buy it. There's no need for me to uh, super detail or scratch build or do anything else. I can just go buy it. The same with structures and rolling stock. Why should I spend my time building models when I can just go out and buy them? Um, that's not what the AP is about. It's about building skills and demonstrating uh, capability. So from that, uh, if people have specific ideas, send them along to me. They will be uh, considered. Thanks, Frank. I have a quickie on that one. Would you have to Jack, go on, Jack. Yeah, quickie with that one. Um, with the standards as they are, the our AP standards, and requirements as they are now. I'm not uh, out in the Pacific Northwest. We're not having any problem finding people who choose to accept the challenge that EP presents and move forward. So the question may be more single modeler oriented than it is association oriented. Okay, Jerry Leone. Quick, quick comment, Gordy. Uh, just to underscore something that Frank said. The achievement program is a learning process. You're learning new skills and you're learning things. And, and by simply going out and perhaps even just super detailing a model that you've built is not quite the learning that, that the AP, uh, uh, that the achievement program really has in mind. Thanks guys. Okay, the next question. Um, is uh, from Lloyd in the NFR. Um, he says, um, just looking for clarification of the AP requirements. In the past six months, we've seen what can be done through the internet. So will the NMRA modify any of the requirements for, for the AP to today's standards in respect to having uh, structures or sceneries or documents approved via the internet? Frank. Well, I, I would hope that uh, Boyd has heard about distance evaluation, which is used in every single region and most divisions. Uh, Jack's laughing because Jack was one of the pioneers in this area. But uh, 
all of the documents uh, are, most of them are all done via the internet now. Uh, I just, as I said, I just finished the AP report for August and probably three quarters of the documents I got came to me electronically. Uh, very few came to me through the mail. And the only ones that came through the mail is where there was a specific question uh, that required my input. And so I, they send me the paperwork in uh, paper form so I can see all the documentation and, and give them uh, useful feedback. Uh, in terms of evaluating structures and scenery, scenery, we've always been able to do that uh, distantly, if you will, or through photographs. Uh, certainly civil and electrical are mostly check the box. Uh, volunteer, author, dispatcher, and official are all uh, all done electronically. Uh, all you need are signatures. And there, an email signature is good enough. Uh, the biggest problem we see and it's really a matter of technology and capability on the part of the modeler usually, and Jack mentioned this earlier perhaps, is that when we look at models, uh, motive power, cars, or structures, there are sometimes issues in for models in the range of, we'll call it 75 to 95 points, where you may not be sure, and the only way you can be, really be certain of where that model will score in an evaluation is to physically see it. Uh, people are trying to do evaluations with iPhones and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, we did some stuff for uh, Carl Smay here in the sun Sunshine region uh, a couple months ago and it worked very, very well, but they had very high tech equipment and they were able to do it quite well. So we are doing it on the internet. One of the things we'll be moving to in the next year is uh, actually fillable PDF forms and so that will make it even easier to fill out the forms. So, yes, we are doing it on the Internet, and hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Gordy, let me, let me, let me, and Frank, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that what we've, what I've heard you guys talk about is the fact that it's easy to do a, a video or Internet evaluation of structures or, and, and, um, and rolling stock, you can, you can tell if the model is not going to be close to a merit, or you can tell if the model is going to for sure get a merit, but it's the gray area from, and again, correct me, Frank, if I'm wrong, it's the gray area where you're getting close to that 87. Correct, no, you're right. Is that, is that correct? That is, that is correct. Yeah. So it's so it's that is correct, Jerry. You're, if you're if if the judges have evaluated your model at 83 points and want to take a closer look at it and look at the joints and look at the glue lines and look at the weathering and that sort of stuff, the video doesn't allow a fine enough um, uh, evaluation to 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 either say yeah this is 87 and a half or it's not 87 and a half. That's that's the gray area and that's where the problem is lying right now. I would. I would just say doesn't always allow you to make that decision. Okay, sometimes okay. it does, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, sure. I mean, as an example of the way some people have got, some divisions have gotten around this or modified their processes is they will have what I'll call AP afternoons, even in this these days of the pandemic, where they will get together in some location, central location, a number of people will bring their models. They'll observe social distancing and masks and all that kind of good stuff. And they'll evaluate the models and then go away. Uh, about three weeks ago, I actually evaluated some models in a Sam's parking lot on the hood of my car. Uh, because that was the only way we could do it. We got together and uh, we did it. Yeah, Gordy, uh, in, in, uh, when we started out up here in the Pacific Northwest, our, the driving factor was the people who were in Alaska and uh, the, the Canadian provinces who basically were isolated and did not have access to high-speed internet or anything reasonable. And so we, what we did was went with, visit, with uh, digital photos 
and and uh, mail in and talk back and forth. And it, we've been able to make that work reasonably well. But I would also point out that you can get scenery and electrical um, using a, a, a digital, a digital uh, video um, right. of your yep. layout. Um, it, so when this is all over with, there is there is in fact from a from a digital slant internet uh, perspective, there's virtually nothing that cannot be accomplished using digital and internet uh, access to make it work. It's there. If you have the equipment. A lot of modelers don't have right. the equipment. Uh, to do it, anyway. Yeah. OK, everyone. Um, so good little chat there about the AP program. Uh, what we're just going to briefly do is hopefully you can all hear me now. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm afraid it's here. Yeah, cool. What we're going to do right now is we're just going to take a five minute break. We're going to get Pete back on with us, uh, Mr. Magoon, and then we will uh, be right back with you. So we'll be taking a five minute break to let everyone have a comfort break, and we'll be back in five.
Sorry. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I have to recover now. Oh. All right, guys, uh, we're back live. Um, Am I here or out? You're here, Pete. You're here. Where have you been? All right, suddenly this thing is now, the audio sounds good to me. I can see good. video. It's, and Did somebody from Forney, Texas try to call me? Yes, yeah, so our technical support was calling you. Yeah. But you're, you're here now, so it's okay. And we're live on Facebook, so please do not swear. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, we next topic. We're, we're back, everyone. We see Pete's back. Our technical support in uh, Namibia called uh, Pete and sorting this out. So, uh, we're going to go to the next topic, which is uh, NMRA standards and conformance. Um, and Pete in the Mid Eastern region has four questions about uh, standards and uh, conformance. Um, question one, uh, what is the status or acceptance of LCC? Okay, if you please. While you've got audio, we'll let you go. <laughs> while it's working, yeah, while it's working, let's try this. Um, <clears throat> uh, status and acceptance of LCC. Basically, LCC is a work in process. It has been going on by an amorphous group for at least 10 years now. And um, they're still working on stuff and trying to get it to a point where it's usable by the average consumer. Uh, right now, you really need a PhD in computer science. Uh, John Beatty, you listening? In order to be able to figure out where these guys are going. Um, you got two, manu you got two, two manufacturers are producing equipment. The acceptance is slow simply due to the complexity of what's going on and the required knowledge. So the open LCB group is, is forging along and we're trying, uh, trying to make progress on that. And as long as I'm here, the other three questions he's got is the L or NMRA promoting LCC implementation using Arduino. The answer is that they're actively working on uh, Arduino stuff uh, as an active component, and this is very much in the early stages of trying to get this stuff working. Uh, we're supporting or embracing Railcom. The answer to that is that the DCC working group is actively involved in uh, bi-directional communication development. So this is Railcom as part of that effort, and here we are. Last question that came in is the NMRA active in dead rail. Well, dead rail is an interesting set of terms. Uh, it's been around a long time. Basically, it means that you don't have to wire your railroad because your power is on board. So they're also calling that power on board. And we are not actively involved in developing that as uh, per se, but all your DCC standards still apply. And DCC standards don't care how the command signal goes to the decoder. It's only how the decoder reacts to the signal that is sent in on the data stream. Uh, and data stream can come in on the rail, it can come in wireless or receiver. You could probably pass it to one of your LPs there who can hoop up the orders when he gets there and drive on. Um, manufacturers are uh, free to develop ways to get that signal in there, and we're trying to stay out of the way. Now, a rail-powered locomotive is not going to work on dead track. That should be obvious, but one never knows. And the NMRA considers this to be like trying to run an O-scale locomotive on HO track. The user needs to understand the rules and the limitations when attempting interoperability. Mr. Leone has his hand up. That's true. You know, put in put in marketing terms. Um, one of the it, it's a chicken and egg problem. It's like I I the, I'm a manufacturer and I want to hear from consumers that they want LCC products and then I'll make them because it's not viable for me as a manufacturer to start making stuff that nobody wants. Conversely, I as a model railroader want more LCC stuff, but I don't know exactly what I want until manufacturers start making the stuff. So we've been running ads for 
years and, and, and we do uh, trade outs with other magazines. So they run in RMC, they run in, um, I think, O Scale. That, and, and each of the ads says, talk to your manufacturers, ask them what they're doing for LCC. In essence, we're asking you to go to the manufacturer and say, I want LCC stuff, would you please develop it for me? And when the manufacturers hear that, they say, hey, there's a demand for this stuff, I'll start making it. But until that little cycle starts, manufacturers aren't gonna invest the time and research to make the products if they don't think there's demand for it. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, so we're just going to go over to an NMRX question and then we'll get on to the next topic because someone's asked this and I don't want to forget about it. Um, someone has asked, when uh, when is, can we next see the next set of clinics on NMRX? Well, uh, quick upcoming events on uh, NMRX uh, would be uh, that in mid September, we're looking for another ask the for mid-September, we're looking for another Ask the Master Model Railroader session. And if there's volunteers uh, who are Master Model Railroaders who want to take part in that, uh, please get in touch with us at uh, nmrex at nmra.org. And then on September the 26th or the 27th, if you are in Australia and New Zealand, uh, we will hold a 12-hour NMRX clinic session. Uh, we are looking for more people to provide clinics. New Zealand, yes. Very promoting our friends in New Zealand there. Uh, we are looking for more clinicians always to give NMRX clinics. You can get credits for volunteer and author AP. Um, so if you want to get in touch, use the same email address, nmrx at nmra.org. And that will be on the 26th of September. Okay, cool. So we'll move on. Uh, that kind of segues us nicely into the next set of questions, which are around um, NMRA online and digital. Um, so question number one comes in from Bill in the Mid-Continent region. Bill asks, uh, the virtual NMRA conventions with their recorded seminars is a fantastic addition for the NMRA to promote the organization. Is there a way that national could provide divisions a way of leveraging these into local meetings with add-ons or supplemental materials for local meetings that we present to? Who wants to take that question? Uh, Jim Gore. Jerry, go ahead. Well, I will. I will say that that's uh, that's up to the individual divisions and regions. There was an SE, uh, SERX uh, divisional uh, regional meeting recently, and I know that several of the division uh, uh, presidents, supers, have gotten a hold of me and asked about whether or not uh, I can put people in the in contact to create those. So there's nothing wrong with creating them. And the format is up to uh, the individual division or the region. You know, and as far as, as materials, I work pretty closely with Christina uh, Zambri, who's our marketing consultant. And, and I think the, the question is, if, if you as a division or you as a region need something specific, email Christina and say, I would love to have this to help promote us. Because I, if you're asking that question, there's probably five other regions or divisions who would like that same kind of material. And the, and the question is, we need to know what it is you want rather than us uh, pretending that we know what you want and giving you something that you may not need. So don't hesitate to email her, email me, and, and we'll see if we can't get <coughs> the works that can help you promote the stuff. Okay, let's throw the caveat in here since I'm gonna to have to do my job. And that is that all these virtual clinics are fine and dandy, they're wonderful. I enjoy them because I learn from clinics no matter how they come along. But there is an intellectual property issue that goes with every single one of these clinics that is delivered online. And you've got a release that needs to be signed out to protect you and protect the NMRA down the road in terms of where this clinic is allowed to go, who's allowed to do what, when, and so on. Sorry. Where's Bob Amsler? I don't see him anymore. I'm on here. It's all right. He's still, he's still here. Uh, but Jack, uh, Jack's got his hand up. Yeah, Gordy, the, um, it, it, the other side of this is if there's something that's been used, it's out there. Uh, it's available on uh, uh, NRA YouTube. 
Uh, there's no reason why it cannot be, in fact, incorporated into a, into a division or a regional meter activity. It's very similar to what's being done in Edutrain. It's just a different available format for material. So rather than reinvent the wheel, this will this stuff will eventually get incorporated back up into uh, the education department and and handle that way. Great. Okay. Uh, we'll move we'll move on to next question. Um, next question is from Burr in the NER, uh, and he asks: uh, Many NMRI regions and divisions and clinics within divisions are continuing to develop virtual clinics or meetings, uh, which could be watched by any member around the world. But we mainly hear about these events uh, that I assume events outside of his local division through word of mouth. Uh, will the NMRI provide members with a way to centralize into a single calendar events that people around the world can join? as this could provide members in the only continuous stream of NMRA model railroad content to consume at uh, Jerry Leone. Um, we, you know, the NMRA currently has a calendar on, on our website, which will list events that we're told about. Um, we've got a, a volunteer who does nothing but keep that calendar updated. So if you've got some virtual events coming up, um, email, again, Christina Zambri, her uh, email address is um, on the website, um, or take a look at that calendar. I think there's a link to the gentleman who's doing the calendar. We need to know about it. We can't go out to 150 some odd divisions and say, have anything going on? So let us know that you've got something going on and it can go right onto that calendar. And, and every one of these virtual events can be seen by everybody in the world. Um, on that calendar, but we already have that central location. It's a question of you guys letting, uh, you know, the, the people in charge of the national calendar know that the, the events exist. Okay, uh, anybody else want to answer any question? I'm just gonna answer a question in there that's directed to me in the, in the comments from Jeff. Um, the guys on the on the call here with us can only see the comments and questions that I ask them uh, as we go through this, but I'm sure that they'll check them out afterwards. Um, but, uh, but but yeah, the, the keep commenting and anything that's in there that's actually got a question mark at the end of it, I will ask the guys. Um, but if it's not got a question mark in and it's just a general comment, I'm not going to pass that along. So, um, but um Walt, I missed your question. Uh, so if you could just post that again, that would that would help me um, because this, this, believe it or not, I'm reading these comments from Australia, so I can't scroll. Um, but we'll we'll move on to some of the questions from the feed now, um, if that's okay with you guys. Um, so we have a question that uh, I didn't catch the name of who asked this question. I was just going as fast as I could. Uh, the question is, can the regions do more virtual conventions? See, the SCR recently did um, a virtual convention with the NMRX team. And I guess that's where this question is coming from. Pete, go ahead. You know what the answer is. Pete, you're dying to answer. Can this. they or may they? <laughs> and the answer is, I... may they? Yes. No problems. I don't have a problem with that. Can they? That's up to the region gathering all the requisite help, the technological resources the clinicians and whatever else they want to do with their region convention. That's not my control. <laughs> Remember that everything the NMRA does is done by, with very few exceptions, I think there are five of them, is that right, Frank? <clears throat> done by volunteers. Oh, you're saying the paid staff. Everybody who's making this happen all over the world. And if you think about this, Gordy, who is in Scotland, is getting his questions from Australia to be answered by people in North America. This is bizarre. <laughs> this is a whole different world than what I grew up in. So it's all good. But yeah, no, to your point, why not? To your point, Frank. To your point. We have roughly a hundred and. We have 18 regions. We have roughly 150 to 160 divisions, depending on who's active. And every one of those is managed by volunteers. And so we've got thousands and thousands of volunteers. 
And the key is to find enough of those in any region or division to put on one of these NMREX events. Fortunately, we have Gordy and his team who put on the NMRAX event. And so we're very, very fortunate there. So I'm sure UK will want, uh, the British region will want Gordy to set up their next convention. And uh, we'll get Brad to do uh, one for Australia, New Zealand. And we'll get Speed to do one for LSR. Uh, but we've got to find, as Pete said, we've got to find local uh, local folks to do those kinds of things. Some regions will have them, some will not. And that's uh, the way it will go. Enough said. Uh, uh, yes, Gordy has put a proposal to the British Region Board of Directors for a five-day virtual convention for the British Region in October. And is working with the Northeastern Region to provide a three-day virtual convention for the Northeastern Region. And will work, and the team will work with any region or division or special interest group of the NMRA that wishes to do a virtual convention for membership and non-members um, during this period of pandemic. We will at least do, help you do the first one, get give you the skills and let you take that forward. Um, okay, next question um, from Dwight. Uh, can members or why can't members uh, join a local division of their choice or decide to move to a division that's outside of where they live? Jack? We'll Gordy, I'll take that one. They can't. They they are they are restricted to region by their geographical address, but within the region itself, if they want to be in a division that they don't live in, they petition by letter their region president for permission to move. It's that simple. However, comma, having said that, it's now up to the region to make sure that the uh, the division assignment on any databases is maintained current by the region because the NRA is going to, the, the headquarters is going to make that assignment based on geographic location. Correct. That was decided a long time ago. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. So there you go, Dwight. Um, <laughs> Marty, I'm not asking that question. Uh, Marty, has, Marty has just put into the comments. I'll ask you guys to give you a giggle. Uh, Marty wants to know if you can recommend uh, a, a reliable electricity supplier in Queensland, Australia. Uh, yes, the answer is not the uh, same people who supply electricity in Southern California. <laughs> okay. Go to, your local, um, go to your local Lowe's and buy a generator. There you go. <laughs> bunnies, bunnies or whatever they call bunnies. Uh, whatever they are in Australia, I can't remember. Brad, Brad will slap me in a minute and tell me what it is. Okay, so Anne, who is a British Region member, uh, asks, uh, I am no longer an NMRE member. I am 55. I have the space and definitely have the income. By the way, he lives in London. The guy has the income. Um, but I don't see value in my NMRE membership anymore, and I've allowed it to lapse. Uh, why should I rejoin? I'll answer our target group bracket. So, uh, Jerry? Um, can I share a screen? I don't, I don't know that yes, I you should be able to. So if I just hit yeah. share, you'll see it. Yeah. Hit share and pick what screen you want to share. Okay. Got it. Um, not, not the one with the engine, not the one with the engines with the, with the covers off. There we go. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I don't think uh, I want yeah. to, I don't think that works. And just open the application that you want to share at the bottom on your toolbar at the bottom. Well, I I did. There we go. There we go. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This this yep. is something. Um, and I'm guessing his name is Anthony, but I'm not going to take that guess. This is something that we publish uh, three times a year, and this lists all the major benefits of the NMRA. We've got a partnership program that will that we has over 40 uh, vendors that will um, save you between 10 and 40% on your purchases because you're an NMRA member. We've got a, a, a directory of rail, model railroad um, layouts across the world that you can visit. We've got online archives of older photographs. You can see the stuff 
that I'm reading here. Um, this, these are benefits. How do I stop? Here we go. Um, these are these are benefits, and and they go on for two pages. Um, that are that that make the NMRA of value to people. It, 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 we've got 150 national. Uh, clinics, uh, clinics from national conventions that you can stream online. We've got probably 30 or 40 professionally produced videos from uh, Train Master TV, Model Railroad Video Plus, and uh, Model Railroad Academy that you can stream online. We've got all sorts of stuff like that. We've got your your NMRA membership. Uh, also gives you membership in the California Railroad, uh, California um, Railroad Museum, where uh, their library, where you can um, get research done and, and have copies made, stuff like that. We've got insurance. We've got all sorts of reasons. If you just dig a little bit below the surface, um, you'll find out that an NMRA membership has a lot of value to it. And, and again, the partnership program alone could save you enough money in the course of a year of, of your purchases to pay for your membership. There, there's a lot of reasons to be an NMRA member. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the partnership scheme. It generally saves me on the import duty. So if you could just all arrange for a really good trade deal in January, that would be lovely. Um, okay. So, um, Matt, Matt Len, uh is, I know you're in South Dakota, but I can't remember uh, in what division you're in, but I know Thousand Lakes, Thousand Lakes. So, Jerry's Legion, uh, region. Um, will somebody be appointed to be in charge of research and development of new uh, technologies for the hobby at NMRA level? Mm -mm. <clears throat> I'm sure not sure what that question good. really was, Gordy, but the NMRA is it's not in the business of developing products or technology. The NMRA is in the business of educating members and using standards and interoperability things to help make the, the world work. Now, we can also... Um, educate manufacturers to the idea that yeah if you put your coupler height right here then everybody else's is going to play well with yours and you'll make more money that's a form of education but we are not in the let's develop the new technology business so i'm not sure where that question goes okay we'll move on um We'll move on, Jack, because I've got loads of questions and not loads of time. Uh, oh, if that's okay. Um, Rick, Rick asked, um, has the NMRA ever discussed or had plans to look at working with educational institutions to build the hobby from a younger age? I don't think we're meaning schools. I think we're meaning more colleges, in, to use the U.S. name and culture. But uh, who wants to take that one? Let me take that one because I've had some experience with it. Um, in some regions and some divisions, uh, the effort has been made to work through community colleges to teach essentially model railroading 101. Um, and it would be open to both the students and the community in the citizens education arena. The results have been mixed as would be expected, but what it does require is a significant effort on the part of the division and a couple of, of um, uh, volunteers to make it work. Trying to do it on a, on a broader scale, for example, model railroading at MIT is probably not in the foreseeable future. Okay. Although the Tech Model Railroad Club is alive and well. Illinois Tech. Well, Illinois let me see. Tech, yeah, is very alive and well. As, as, a, former, as a former university administrator, um, let me tell you that that's a great idea. The problem is that the universities have is again with two things, one liability and universities are in the business, whether they say it or not, of making money. And sometimes that becomes the problem is the tuitions for those things at a university or a college become quite expensive. So it's, it sometimes becomes a toss up just because of the cost to the college or the university. Thanks, Jim. 
Um, okay, we'll move on. Uh, John from the UK asks a great, uh, this is a really good question. Um, and this is a question in terms of the global reach of the organization. Um, so what influence does the NMRA have over standards in Europe and the rest of the world in model railroading? Guys, do you want me to answer this or do you guys? No, no, I'll take that one. If nobody else will, Gordy, we are the standard. <laughs> We're the standard. Yeah, and if, if, on that. <laughs> if if you have if you have manufacturers who are building things not within that standard, then it be you know that the modeler has the choice of buying the stuff that that meets NRA standards or winging it on his own. Uh, Dietrich. Yeah, the NMRA write standards for American railroads. The Europeans write standards for European railroads. Uh, you know, Great Britain, England has about three or four groups that write different standards for different things. Um, but primarily, our worldwide reach is a reach of American railroads. So we really don't have standards for, um, well, European stuff. And I think maybe one of the oncoming users of our standards is China. Um, I don't think we've talked to them lately. Maybe Pete has been in with them more lately, but um, that's what we do is American railroad standards. In other words, North American prototype or North but, American uh, outline is but, who we are pretty much. Just, yeah, but hang on guys. Um, the NMRA DCC is something that's used globally and adopted globally by around the world. That's not a North American standard. That is something that, that shows the global reach of the NMRA, is it not? Yes, it is. Right. And okay. there is a lot of effort to make sure that we stay compatible with um, the Railcom group in Europe. Germany specifically, because that's really where it started with Bern Lenz, brought it over to the NMRA and it was developed here. But um, the Europeans have decided to form their own local group, but there's a lot of coordination, a lot of talk going back and forth to make sure that we do stay together on whatever's developed. Thanks guys. Um, uh... Jeff asks, um, does HQ or can HQ send a welcome email when they process membership, ideally telling the person their division and region, but so just equally so that the member uh, knows that their membership request has been received and, and can start to get involved locally with the NMRA? Frank? We're working on that. We did not have the capability up until recently, and that's one of the things we hope to do in the next several months, is to provide that uh, acknowledgement, if you will. Uh, our new system that we've just put into place in the company store, which is the renewal process, will allow us, I believe, to do that. But I will follow up on that. Uh, okay. Let me take one more step, because this is important. When a new member is brought on board, um, unless he did that specifically uh, through HQ and online, um, then his um, he, he was recruited by somebody. And, and in addition to which, the division knows about that individual within 30 days of the time that application is sent in. It is up to the division to grab onto that person, bring him into the group, welcome him, make him part of the group, that's the start of the retention process. Uh, uh, an email from headquarters is not going to make that person, that new member, any more a member than not receiving an email. I, I well, will say, that... Frank. No, I will say, Gordy, that as soon if somebody does register online, they immediately get a receipt back, if you will. It says, "Thank you for buying this," or "Thank you for joining." But uh, a personalized email or a, a specific email, uh, I'll see what we can do there. OK. 
Okay. Um, great, thank you. Um, see you guys. Put your suggestions in the comments. You know, this is your great first, probably first, I think, opportunity we've ever had to uh, be worldwide and have people be able to influence decisions and, and put their views across uh, to the directors. So, Daz uh, Gay talked about the value of the Australia, and he asked um, more about the board here. Uh, do you feel that there's room on the national board for younger members, i.e., younger than the current board of directors? I'm sorry. The answer is yes. Stand up, put your name in nomination, and get yourself elected. You are welcome here. Okay, great. I'd, um, like, to, I'd like to retire. <laughs> You gotta spot putting your name on the ballot. <laughs> hey, Gordy, uh, I missed okay. about half of what you just said over there, but I think what the gist of that was is: is there a way to get younger people involved with the NMRA leadership? And the answer is yes, indeed. We do have some things that we are looking for in terms of qualifications for running the global corporation, because the NMRA has to be run in a business-like manner. It is not a business per se, because a business by definition is for profit. But we do have to deal with uh, significant assets, uh, issues related to laws of the state of Ohio and various other places, and so on and so on. So we do want people with certain qualifications, those are listed on the website. So you're thinking about or running for office. There's a sheet in there you can find. Please look at it, give it some thought. And if you can check off the boxes, we want to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pete. I apologize if people are having problems with my audio. Um, in addition, the Jerry. evil mentions the upcoming elections and what positions are available or are going to be opening. And there are links in that within that um, that article that people can go to to read exactly what Pete was just talking about and to to, uh, to find out more about the election process. Absolutely. Um, OK, um, great. I think what I'm going to do, Brad, is I'm going to cut cut the view to you off and see if it improves my audio. Right. Hopefully that's just improved my audio. Um, so we'll go to the data. Yeah, it's team viewer. It affects the audio. So we'll, uh, we'll go to uh, Andy. Um, it's just some feedback really to you guys. Um, he says, thanks for a brilliant event. Um, he never thought uh, he would be uh, able to have a meeting um, with the board of directors where he could ask questions live. So good thumbs up to you guys. Um, so Scott, uh, asks, can the board explain the need for copyright approval if the content is not being distributed? That's a question that was asked earlier. And that sounds well, like a Mr. Angler question. That's a bad question. Yes, and the, the reason we need that is we have to have the permission of the individual given the intellectual property to publish it. For instance, him giving a clinic is publishing it. Him sending it into the uh, NMRA magazine, that's someplace else we need to get permission. So right now we're actually working on a, a form that should cut across the entire NMRA. It'll cover NMRAX, it'll cover the, the magazine uh, and stuff like the conventions. And so we're, we hope to roll that out, that we have those permissions. And the other thing is we want people to be able to see uh, some of these things later on. So for instance, we do videotape uh, clinics and things like that. They're on the member side of the NMRA website, but we have obtained permission from the person who did that to put it over there for the other members to see. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'm not seeing any hands up, so we'll move on. Um, Walt from the SER asks, um, 
in, in, instead of the rail pass, could the NMRA offer uh, an NMRA X, he's calling it, an NMRA X membership for 1995 that would just give somebody access to the website and to digital content and maybe a, a restriction on other things? Frank, do you want to take that? No. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I just what you said. You've answered most of the membership questions. <laughs> Let me let me understand. Let me understand. The question is: Could we offer a not a rail pass? What well, is a rail pass in a, a way? Membership. A digital membership. So I mean, if you be, if you do a rail pass, you get automatically you get the digital membership, if you will, and access to NMR. Well, NMRX, you don't even have to be a member. But I'm not quite sure what the thought is I think, there. I think what Walt's uh, suggestion is is to I'll expand upon it a little bit when what I think is, it is that he's asking is um, that um, a um, could the NMRA offer a lower tier of membership that just is allowing somebody to access the digital uh, content, i.e. have a login for the website and be able to uh, access the stuff that's on the website and the partnership program. And that membership be at a lower rate so that the person could say, I am a member of the NMRA rather than the $50 rate that we have well, at the moment. We'll, we'll think about it. But my, my first thought is no. Uh, if you're a, you're a member or you're not a member and we don't have, we have student members. We have student members, we have full members and, and that's about it. So we'll, I'll put it on the list to think about, but I don't think so. Okay. Um, moving on, we have uh, Scott from the MCR. Um, he asks, going forward, will some or all of the national conventions be live streamed? That's a good question. Uh, Stay tuned and see. Jerry and then John and then Peter. Jerry? Here's something to consider. We've had... Um, some of the venues where the national conventions have been held have very strict video uh, uh, streaming and broadcasting uh, regulations that says that nothing can be streamed or, or, you know, or even, you know, I don't want to say videotape, but you can't do anything live from conve certain convention centers and certain, uh, certain of the hotels. So that could be a possible uh, problem doing that. John? And, um, I, the, 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 basically, it's a matter of impossibility. Uh, if you've ever been to a national convention, there's the, the model display room, and there's an auction room, and there's layout tours, and there's prototype tours, and we, we could stream the odd clinic, and in fact, they have been recorded and put on the members on the NMR website. But the, you know, can you... Um, you know, live stream an entire NMRA convention, I think, no, that's just physically impossible. I, I haven't got enough arms. I already tried to run around uh, the last three years I've spent going to the national conventions, last four years now, I suppose we didn't get to St. Louis this year, and uh, trying to put on NMRA social media as much as I could of the convention, and it nearly kills me every time. We have live streamed and done a Facebook Live from the Kansas City Convention in, 20, in 2018. Um, me and Christina did that. I put the equipment to do that in my suitcase and flew it all the way from Scotland to Kansas City in order to do it because um, it's unaffordable for us to hire someone locally to do it. So I guess, you know, it's having been a person involved in this, it's not a board member, but a person involved in doing this, it's, it's difficult. It's not impossible. But it's it's difficult, and it will require it will require resource. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, the whole thing is impossible, <laughs> absolutely impossible. Like it's like NMREX on steroids. <laughs> so, uh, anybody else want to add anything? Can we move on to the next question. No, good. Um, okay, uh, Jeff asks: um, Is there a zip code list of divisions online anywhere where someone can can look up? based on their zip code. Jerry? The, the, the problem is that not all divisions are divided. It, it, they're not divided by zip code. Some of them are divided by county boundaries. Some of them are divided by state boundaries. I, I, I don't know that, that, that 
Frank, does would headquarters have a, a list like that? A, a zip code? Uh, do they? We do. There is a mass. There is a mass there's a master chart of accounts that's by zip code uh, for all parts of the U.S. And depending on where you are, you're in that, depending on where your zip code is, you're in a specific region and division. Uh, the thing I would do is urge people, they can at least, they can find out what division and region they're in just by looking at the NMRA map on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I, I've worked that out. As a division two for Scotland, Orkney's in Scotland. So yeah. Uh, the uh, other thing uh, they can uh, <laughs> if somebody wants to know where a division is uh, that is not then that's not in their region, the step a little bit of uh, a little bit of work on the internet will do it. Go look up the region uh, website, and then from the region website, download to the various divisions, and the information is there. If you want. If you want an easy, here's a complete list, um, probably not going to happen. And it changes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what Jack just that? said is a great idea, except that if you go look at information available on region and division links to NMRA website, what you find is that a lot of those links don't work. A lot of those links are behind paywalls. There is very little information that is updated. Some of those things haven't been updated since 2006. And it is a very frustrating experience. Yes, I have done it. Yes, I know how to do it. Yes, I have had problems finding simple data that would tell me what's going on in this area because I'm about to move there and I want to find out where I can go play trains. And it's not available. So there it is. Again, this is the region and the division making people feel welcome or making people feel like we don't want you here. Go away. It's your choice, folks. It's not that difficult. Okay. Well, but don't uh... complain when we don't have membership when you're not helping out. Sorry. Okay. Well, That's a pet peeve of mine. That... Okay. We're moving on. We're moving on. We're moving on. Yeah. We're moving on. Um, okay. So John in Canada asks, uh, will there be term limits for all members of the board so that any member can, can not serve for longer in any position or any, any number of positions uh, for more than eight years total? There are term limits for the board. For directors, the board, the board members, the directors are limited to two consecutive elected terms. That's six years. Now, now note that the second. key there is elected terms. Now, in the case of Canada, since this question came from Canada, <clears throat> we had an elected director in Canada who had to resign his position very shortly after he was elected. There was a gentleman who was appointed to fill that seat, which he did for the remainder of that term. He was then eligible to run for two terms of his own, which he did and which he served and served admirably well, I might add, including several years as lead director. So yes, that system is in place. It's just a question of paying attention. Frank. Frank. There is, however, no limit on the on running for different offices for any number of times. You can't run for the same office more than two times, but you can run for a different office for the directors. Yeah. There are no term limits for the president and vice president, however. <clears throat> okay. Other than um, getting tired. Your audio was cutting in and out on me, Frank. So I don't. I assume you're right. Yeah, he's fine. It was good. Um, okay, so um, moving on. Andy Ambrose in the UK asks, um, "Are we saying that the NMRA X is a virtual region?" I'm going to answer that. No, it isn't. <laughs> but um, 
Uh, we'll go to Jim. Jim will come to you in a second. Uh, yeah, we want to come on the same thing about term limits, or do we want to do this? Well, oh, okay. I, I have to depart, so I'm just saying. Oh, okay. Goodbye. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jim. Um, so the NMRAX is not a region; it's a program of the NMRA. As the program manager, I can say that. Uh, but the program is hoping to support regions and divisions to go and do more virtual stuff. We've worked with many regions and divisions, um, probably two of the most active uh, virtual regions would be the British and the Australians. We've done this for a while. We've had people come and present clinics from around the world to our conventions, given how remote we are. And my division in Scotland is fully remote because of the fact that the division super lives on an island that's three and a half square miles wide. So, uh, well, in total the group. So we'll move on from that one. I've got other questions. If we can keep going. I heard that the voting say. was rigged on that election, Gordy. Which election? The, 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 the one in Orkney. Uh, no, no, it was a case of uh, he who stands up gets uh, gets the head shot off. Um, you know, um, okay, so there is a question um, that, questions, 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 questions. Uh, so the only other question there is, is uh, regarding the 2021 convention and that it has been said that TSG Multimedia are going to stream the 2021 convention. Do we know if that's the case? That's well, a lot uh, of question. Yeah, um, I haven't heard anything about it. I think I should have by now. So okay. my guess is that answer is no. Okay. Yes, and, and Jeff uh, Jeff Schultz there has just put in the comments that streaming from the convention is not quite the same as streaming the convention. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think that's us on our time. Um, that's the questions that were there in the feed at this point. Um, hopefully, uh, that was really good for people. I really want to say thank you to the uh, directors and uh, president and Vice President of the NMRA and to Bob, um, who came and joined us. This is something that I've wanted to do for a while. I've been uh, pestering Christina and Jerry about doing this for, for a little while now. Um, and I'm really pleased that this has happened. Uh, it's been great to bring you together uh, with our members and potential members and model railroaders around the world. Um, hopefully uh, in the future, who knows, we may repeat this. Um, but thank you so much. For, for members, it's worth saying that there will be a members meeting this year. Um, I, I've left my Anna Murray magazine that arrived this morning uh, in the kitchen. Uh, I can't remember what day it is. If somebody wants to just shout that out, if we remember what day it is. But I know 13th that you, September. 13th of September. Thank you. It's a go to meeting. If you're a member, um, you can email uh, vpadmin at nmra.org and you will uh, be able to register for that event and come along and take part, ask live questions to uh, the board and uh, hear about their plans for the NMRA and for next year and uh, how we move forward in the recovery from uh, the current COVID situation. So well, uh, we if you remember, we appreciate the opportunity, Gordy. Thanks for, thanks for letting us do this. Oh no, it's- Yeah, uh, thank you. Like, thank you, Gordy. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks to all of the volunteers who make this organization run. You're here. You're here. Thank you, everyone. All right, Brad, I think that's a wrap. I've got to go and operate somebody's layout in New Jersey, so let's wrap it. <laughs>